everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar. On behalf of BIS Research and Mimic Technologies, I would like to welcome you all to our emerging tech webinar on Robotic Simulators and Emerging Frontier in the Era of Healthcare Robotics. I, Jismal Matthew, a research analyst at BIS Research, will be the host and moderator for today's event. Now, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers for the event. Firstly, we have our guest speaker, Mr. Jeff Berkeley. Jeff is Chief Operating Officer, Chairman and Founder at Mimic Technologies, which is both a pioneer and leader in robotic surgery simulation. Jeff brings decades of experience in the fields of haptics, surgery simulation and real-time finite element modeling. We also have our host speaker, Mr. Manu Kaushik Chanda. Manu is lead analyst, healthcare practice at BIS Research. He holds profound experience in spearheading market intelligence studies on various healthcare technologies such as surgical robotics, minimal invasive surgery technologies, and surgical simulation systems, to name a few. I thank both the panelists for their gracious presence. A very warm welcome to you, gentlemen. The agenda for today's discussion is outlined here. Manu will start with giving a brief introduction about rising surgical errors and related concerns and potential technologies to overcome the same. Further, Manu will also be emphasizing on the current market scenario and future potential of different opportunities. Towards the end, Manu would be concluding today's discussion with recommendations for the industry. Post this, Jeff will be pro providing his insights on how aviation industry has inspired the use of robotic simulation in healthcare industry, coupled with the economic benefits associated with the clinical incorporation of robotic simulators and future potential. In the next 25 minutes, we are all keen to learn from your experience about simulation technologies, transfiguring surgical education. And towards the end of the discussion, I will open the panel to the audience for any questions. I would request everyone in the audience to kindly mute your phones during the session and type in the questions towards the end of the webinar. Any questions that we are not able to answer today shall be reverted offline. Having said that, let me open this panel for discussion and invite thoughts from Manu. Over to you, Manu. Thank you, Jismol. It wouldn't be surprising to quote that US is the country with the highest healthcare expenditure, right? But one would be absolutely surprised to learn that US is also one of the leading countries with an enormous incidence of surgical errors. In 2018, US surgical malpractice payouts were valued to be $1 billion approximately. That is massive. Presently, one in every 16 surgical procedures in US is recognized to be a surgical error. In 2018, U.S. witnessed approximately 3 million cases of surgical errors. The scenario gets further baffling if the statistics associated with other developed countries such as Japan and China comes into focus. The countries together contributed to approximately 66% of global incidents of surgical errors. China reached the second highest incidence of surgical errors. The global incidence of surgical errors was acknowledged to be 5.5 million in 2008, witnessing a compound annual growth rate of 3.91%. The surgical errors incidence was considered to be 7.9 million in 2018. Acknowledging the growth in the past 10 years, the surgical errors incidence is anticipated to reach devastating 10.5 million by 2029. The associated economic burden is expected to reach distressing 
161 billion dollars by 2029 the rise in surgical errors incidents augmented by steep growth in healthcare cost across the globe is collectively intensifying the enormity of surgical error cost the global surgical errors economic burden grew at a growth rate of 6.35% in the past 10 years to reach approximately 99 billion dollars in 2018 the us surgical errors economic burden was considered to be 46 billion dollars approximately in 2018 in correlation with incident statistics china is the country with second highest surgical error economic burden followed by china countries namely australia italy and france were recognized to occupy the next leading positions respectively acknowledging the immensity of the situation the healthcare regulatory bodies have rolled out customized measures such as stringent regulations implementing the surgical checklist however it is recognized that measures implemented weren't actually addressing the chief causes of surgical errors so let's explore the chief causes of surgical errors in detail the six identified causes of surgical errors are listed on the current slide the procedural incompetence and lack of adequate pre operative planning are the leading causes of surgical errors together the two irregularities contributed for 51% of surgical error cases witnessed in the last 10 years apart from them poor peer communication is acknowledged to be attributing to 12% cases hence the statistics evidently show that the lack of adequate surgical training is the predominant cause of massive surgical errors incidents the growing emphasis on patient safety is strengthening the obligation of decreasing the dependency of surgical training over the apprentice mentor relationship and operating room based training a dynamic shift in surgical education from traditional apprenticeship model to a competency based model is required to address the enormous surgical errors burden robotics surgical simulation systems are one of the ground breaking technologies which hold the enormous potential to transfigure the surgical educational practices the recent advancements in computational technologies augmented by immeasurable knowledge of functioning of human body have made disruptive technologies such as robotic simulation systems a reality the key abilities of robotic surgical simulation system are provision of standardized safe practices for surgical training with iterative practice freedom scope for developing case specific operative planning provision of realistic scenario to utmost accuracy scope for framework enabling training for the entire operational team and provides competency based framework which enables performance assessment the incorporation of robotic surgical simulation systems in parts extraordinary hand eye coordination and ambidextrous surgical skills it also enhances psychometric skills and intra team synchronization to impart case specific capabilities further it enables the development of type specific clinical capabilities the proven clinical benefits associated with robotics surgical simulation systems are it improves productivity by average of 35% reduces procedural duration by average of 25% to 35% and the most important it reduces scope for surgical er errors by 6 to 7 times 
one of the main industries misconceptions surrounding the robotic surgical simulation technologies is that the use of technology is only limited to the training associated with robotic surgeries but the current market withholds several novel systems offering virtual reality experience accompanied by haptics force feedback for training related to traditional surgeries companies namely 3d systems ca vitramed and voxel man are offering novel solutions catering to conventional and minimal invasive surgeries the following slide provides information about the vital factors impacting the dynamics of technology adoption they are drivers challenges technology disruptions and industry trends the first four factors mentioned are expected to drive the growth of adoption of technology both in short term and long term periods whereas the next three factors mentioned would be hampering the growth in short term period however the market is expected to witness substantial changes through the interference of regulatory bodies which would aid in addressing the challenges considering the current industry's focus few technological advancements such as ai integration and web based simulation development are anticipated to become a reality in the long term period however bis research suggests industry to also focus on technologies enabling patient anatomy integration with robotics simulator which will be discussed in the following slides currently the market is witnessing several collaborations between technology providers and surgical robotics companies this trend is anticipated to continue for the next 10 years and might possibly result in major consolidations the global robotics surgical simulation systems market is currently in its nascent phase the current potential of market was valued 296 million dollars approximately however the market is expected to grow 10 folds in the next 10 years regulations enforcing the mandated use of robotic simulation systems are anticipated to be rolled out in near future further the growing incorporation of surgical robots into clinical practice would significantly appraise the requirement of robotic simulators considering these factors the potential of the market is anticipated to reach 2.38 billion dollars by 2029 looking at different surgical disciplines currently robotic simulators are predominantly incorporated for gynecology general and urology surgeries the dominance of gynecology and general surgeries is attributed to large install base of intuitus da vinci robot which is accompanied by its robotics simulator general surgery discipline is also anticipated to witness massive growth rate in the near future followed by general surgery orthopedic and neurological surgery disciplines are also anticipated to witness impressive growth in the near future the massive growth uh, is anticipated due to launch of novel surgical robots by conglomerate players such as metronic smith and nephew and verb surgical having said that i would request mr jeff to take over the platform over to you jeff thank you manu i thought you did a wonderful job really laying down the 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 problem in front of us uh, i'd like to pile on just a little bit more i I've, i've seen reports indicating that we have as many as 250 to up to 400,000 deaths a year just in the us due to preventable medical errors um you can and in those are big numbers so they're hard to get your head around so uh, this is the equivalent of one jumbo jet full of people crashing every single day 
uh, if not more. So, so I think uh, we wouldn't have a lot of faith in the aviation industry if it was publicly known how many errors actually take place in U.S. operating rooms. Um, and sticking with the aviation industry, I think it's apt to make a comparison. Uh, surgery simulation is often, often referred to as flight simulation for surgeons. Um, however, they are very different technologically. Uh, it is much more difficult to simulate the human body, deformation, bleeding, and so forth, as uh, opposed to fluid dynamics that's used in aviation. Uh, it's also the application and the requirement of the use of simulation. Uh, aviation, like most high-risk industries, requires simulation not only for training, but also for high-stakes testing. Uh, but we're, we're really not there yet in, in medicine. Um, you could say that uh, initial surgical privileging is similar to the initial pilot's license. Um, people get their privileges and they typically keep them for life. Um, if you wanna do a new procedure or if you wanna learn to fly a new plane, there usually is an upgrade certification process. But this, this is really where things end. Um, the idea of demonstrating hand-eye motor competency and measuring that objectively only takes place, uh, you're at least only tested for it in aviation. Um, few hospitals uh, do it in the United States, although the trend is growing. Um, typically, you would go into the OR, you get proctored for a certain amount of cases, say three. It's usually, that's enough, and you're good to go. Um, if a proctor decides that you need extra training, this may happen, but typically, it's, it's three and done. Um, if you are a, a pilot and you don't fly, for uh, a month, you have to test back in on a simulator. You can go nearly a year or more very often in surgery, especially if you're a GYN, uh, and you're still allowed to conduct uh, surgery. And this is surgery in general. This isn't just robotics. And uh, certainly an annual certification. This is not done in medicine at very many institutions. And this can be very important, not uh, only to see if people maintain their skills, but often it uncovers uh, medical conditions, whether the surgeon is losing their eyesight or they're developing too much tremor for even the robot to filter out. Uh, so these are all things that could be done in medicine, and we like to think there's a trend towards it. Next slide, please. So sticking with the uh, con uh, the comparison to the aviation industry, uh, if we look what happened when second generation simulators advanced to the third generation, uh, there was an 85% reduction in a, a, a controlled flight into terrain. So this is, this is crashing, 85% reduction in crashes. And then we went from third to fourth generation, we had a 75% uh, reduction in loss of control and flight incidences. This is, this is where some error got you off, uh, got, got you off your flight path. Uh, so maybe not as bad as crashing, but still very, very significant. So the, these were pretty profound impacts that the aviation industry had. And you can bet that pilots did not want these extra requirements for flight simulation training and certifications. But after a while, it had such a big impact on the industry in terms of safety and efficiency uh, that it became required, and, and now it's just common. Uh, so our hope is that we start to see something similar applied in medicine over the next decade. Next slide, please. So uh, simulation is very much, uh, could be considered like a flight simulator. Uh, you can train in the OR, but it's very expensive. Um, one set of instruments for one set of procedures is approximately two to $3,000. Uh, there's also OR costs. There's also coordinating a team to get you into the OR. Um, now we have made simulation uh, for intuitive surgical, license it to them so that you can use the actual surgeon console for training, but still you have to get into the ORs. This means training on nights and weekends typically. And uh, when we compare the utilization of in OR training, uh, to outside the OR training with a emulator of, of the robot, uh, we find that utilization goes way up. And this is because it's accessible any time, uh, at any time. It's, it's just not very practical for you to sacrifice valuable OR time just for training. There's, there's a cost to that. You're, uh, hopefully your robot is being used uh, nonstop during working hours. Uh, simulation outside the OR also allows for independent training. Uh, we offer a portable simulator that could even be taken home so you can train in the comforts of your own home. There's the team to consider. Uh, there's coordination with an entire team. 
Um, and you really can boost efficiency for your whole team if you train before your robot's even installed. In a simulator, just having a simulator isn't a magic bullet. It's got to be implemented into a program. Surgeons are certainly very, very busy. And uh, no matter how fun the simulation can be, it is, it is not something people are going to do and put in the hours needed unless it's something that's required as a, broad, a broader program. And it's, it's key to be able to collect data on that training, monitor it, and make sure people are sticking with the program and identify people that are having difficulties so you can get them the extra attention uh, that they need. And, and just like a flight simulator is much more affordable, and, and cheaper for training uh, compared to flying with a real plane. Same thing with uh, robotic simulators, uh, which uh, start uh, at 35,000, go up to about uh, 80,000. So, and also, um, you know, we're, we're very happy. We're working with a number of robotics companies. Uh, so the ability to provide the same environment for training with the same scoring uh, that's common across platforms means that you aren't having to learn a new training system every time you get on a new robot. Uh, what you're learning is the differences between one robot and another because there's going to be a lot of variability. We can have single port robots, multi port robots. Uh, we're going to have robots that are very procedure focused, more that are generalized, like the Da Vinci. So uh, each are going to have their advantages in terms of features or costs. Uh, so it, it's it's good uh, to have an environment to safely learn these new robots as opposed to learning on them in the OR, uh, which is what is unfortunately pretty typical. Next slide. There's a certainly a cost impact. Um, if we look at surgeons, they it's not as if we're looking at pilots. Pilots are trained to a certain level of proficiency, so you get a pretty standard performance. Surgeons are really all over the board, and there's a huge difference. Um, if you compare the bottom quartiles to the top quartile of performers and surgeons, the, the significance is big. The bottom quartile is about 75% uh, of an entire team's cost. So here are just two studies to look at this, uh, looking at bottom quartile to top quartile. Um, the first is a study that was done uh, with uh, Baylor, and uh, they compared their bottom performing 50 surgeons to their top performing 50 surgeons, and this was an extra million dollars a year in costs uh, due to inefficiencies uh, in the OR. If we wanna look at it procedures, um, one of the procedures done the most is, is a hysterectomy uh, using the Da Vinci robot. And you can see if you compare the top quartile to the bottom quartile, we've got 90 minutes case time versus 140, uh, four times the complication, 80% longer length of stays, 3%, three times as much uh, readmissions, um, averaging out to about $3,900 per case. This could be the difference between profitability in a case or, or not. So, and, uh, and this doesn't even include what would happen if you have a lawsuit, which can really just take down a program. Next slide, please. And simulation can get people up the learning curve fast. Um, typically, you're gonna hear that it takes about 70 to 200 robotic cases for somebody to become an expert. But if you add simulation into the mix, I'd argue you can perform like an expert your very first case. Uh, so this is a study that was out of uh, Morristown Memorial Hospital, uh, led by a Dr. Culligan, and they had five surgeons that wanted to put a rigorous uh, pre-training program in place for their GYNs. Uh, so they picked 10 of our exercises that they thought were most applicable to hysterectomy. They measured themselves, and they asked a study group of board-certified surgeons who knew gynecology but had not used the robot uh, to simply meet their scores in each of these 10 exercises just once. Now, the exercise links typically go anywhere from, uh, from 2 to 15 minutes. So when you see an average of 20 hours of simulation time, this, this is pretty significant. Um, and you, I think that's also important to note the range. Um, the, the time it took with this 14 groups ranged anywhere from uh, approximately 10 hours to 40 hours. Um, this is very significant difference, meaning that everybody learns at a different rate. So the idea of, of giving somebody so many hours of training is just not appropriate. Uh, for some people, a certain amount of training is going to be too much, and for others, it's going to be too little. So training to a standard can have a significant impact. And in this case, these novice surgeons on their very, very, very first case were able to perform just like the experts who created the standard. Uh, there was statistically the same operative time, statistically the same blood loss. 
And I think what's really interesting to note is if you compare this to the control group, these are folks that had privileges but may not work doing uh, enough, maybe weren't doing as many cases as the experts. Well, they had 50% longer cases, uh, they had significantly more blood loss, and even with video review, the first time surgeons outscored the control group. So the idea that uh, we should have people on this learning curve, this 70 to 200 uh, patients, um, is, is frankly just unacceptable. And there are ways to address it if institutions are willing to really get behind the idea of training before people get into the OR. Next slide. So this is what your traditional da Vinci uh, OR may look like. Um, you're going to have a surgeon at the surgeon console, uh, which you see in the center of your screen. Um, you're gonna have a bedside assist. This bedside assist is going to hand in needles, uh, do retraction, uh, maybe use specialized instrumentation such as ultrasound or applying clips. And this is done through a traditional laparoscopic type of interface. So it's, it's handheld tools. Uh, you have a, a scrub nurse and circulating nurse. You have people that set up the OR uh, exchange instruments. And you might even have a, a driver's ed style second console where a surgeon could observe another surgeon. Uh, they can even hand off control in cases of, of education. Um, next slide. So when you think about simulation, it isn't just the surgeon that needs to be trained. Anyone in that OR can make a critical error. So everybody needs the training. Uh, so we have an emulator, uh, the DV Trainer. We've, uh, it's been out there for about a little over a, a decade now. Um, this is our emulator of the Da Vinci Surgeon Console. Uh, full force feedback capabilities, um, even though there's not a lot of force feedback in robotics, but it is, it is we try to emulate the Da Vinci as close as we can, um, but for a fraction of the cost, as opposed to a half million dollar surgeon console, uh, the DV Trainer is around $80,000. We also have a, a role for the surgical assist. So this is the laparoscopic uh, interface where they train uh, with full force, they feel everything in the environment and uh, they can train as independently uh, their laparoscopic skills. Then they work in a collaborative environment with the surgeon so that you can establish communication skills and conduct things like handoffs and coordinated efforts in surgery. And then for those uh, who uh, really need access to simulation, especially if you want to train in private. Um, no better way to get access to training is to take our portable simulator. It's like a bit of a heavy suitcase that you can take home and set up on your dining room table. Um, and what we'll see is many multiples of utilization if we look at the DV trainer tour, uh, compared to simulation usage uh, on the skill simulator, which is embedded into the DaVinci system itself. Next slide. There's also coordinating the whole team. So there are applications for full head mounted display. Uh, the head mounted display technology and hand tracking is getting really, really good. So the ability to go in and practice setting up uh, the robot relative to different patient types um, is, is now possible. And you can coordinate everybody in the team together. Um, it's, it's difficult to get the team together to train in the OR. So um, more traditional immersive VR may be a, a pretty important application. And this, I think, is especially uh, going to be the case uh, when it comes to situations, um, emergency situations, where you have to quickly undock the robot and uh, uh, convert to open um, in the case of uh, a difficult uh, surgery. Next slide. So uh, just to talk a little bit about how the ecosystem works, um, all of our simulators are connected to a cloud. Um, we, you know, again, if you, if you can't measure what's happening, you can't change what's happening. Uh, so um, next slide. We, uh, so we begin with this uh, cloud-based system that collects data from everywhere. We've collected more data on training than, than anyone. Um, but even though simulators are a lot more affordable than actual robots, uh, it can be just as difficult to get 35,000 as it can be 2 million uh, for a robot. So a training hub is typically where most of your robots take place. It's usually where most of your proctors are, your high-end surgeons, your robotics committee uh, may sit here. Uh, next slide. Um, but what do you do with all the other hospitals that might have one robot and, and they just, you just can't afford to send a fleet of simulators everywhere? This is, this is where our portable simulators play a role. You can send these out and uh, get people simpler uh, training protocols and testing protocols. Next slide. And if you do 
find somebody that has an issue that can't advance in a training protocol or fails their test, you can bring them into the training hub and you can get them that advanced attention they need. The idea is to identify people that are gonna have challenges before the OR uh, so that training doesn't take place and those mistakes don't take place on people. Next slide. So right now simulation is typically used for orienting people to how to use the robot, how to do basic surgical skills and uh, Use thing, things like suturing or cautery or uh, using various instrumentation and visualization tools that are associated with robotics. Um, we do use some augmented reality um, for procedural. Um, sorry, the, I know the, the video comes through a little jumpy here. Sorry for that, but um, at least you get a, a general idea. This is one of our augmented reality applications. Uh, so, so this is, so this is uh, really kind of how simulation is used today. Um, but I'll argue that uh, procedural simulation really isn't where the value is. If you're in a flight simulator, you're gonna fly from Seattle to LA maybe once, uh, and then you kind of got it, you move on. Uh, and the data reflects this in the utilization of our own simulators. Um, but if you produce complications, uh, next slide, and hopefully you'll get to see some of these. If you do complications, these are things surgeons are gonna do over and over again. A pilot will train getting out of a stall repetitively. Uh, this, this is why Sully Sullenberger didn't crash into the, the Potomac. He practiced in simulation over and over again uh, for emergency situations. So, so this is really where we need to get to, not just a one and done procedure simulator, we need to get various scenarios that surgeons aren't going to come across typically in the OR. Um, and by the way, this is a real scenario for a gynecological procedure. And you can see it gets uh, uh, pretty scary pretty, pretty fast. Next slide. So um, finally, just uh, who, who are the people that benefit? Uh, and there, there really are a lot of stakeholders um, that are looking at simulation right now. Obviously, it's great for the surgeon because they can get simulation training both independent and as a team and they can really be compared to the rest of the world so you really know how you stack up next to other surgeons at your experience level or even in your discipline or even in your hospital within your region right now where we have a big change in hospitals um, with the affordable care act you don't get paid again and again uh, for correcting your mistakes uh, you do not get paid for your readmissions so in robotics, it's a procedure growth is about 17%, and there's already about a million procedures being done. So there's tremendous opportunity as robots take over the OR uh, to put in processes for improving efficiency so that uh, the surgeons can be safer in the OR, uh, but also there's greater throughput. And, uh, and when it comes to the medical device industry, that's what they want. They want throughput. Um, the idea of paying $2 million for a robot, I think, is going to go away. I think robots are going to be either given away or sold at cost um, so long as you commit to an instrument uh, uh, program. Um, it is a razor blade model. So there's lots of interest in um, surgeries being fast and efficient. And certainly for companies just launching a robot, they need to be safe because there's nothing worse uh, than really bad press right when you launch a robot. So I think everybody can kind of get behind this. And of course, the big beneficiary really is the patient. Um, because uh, we, we really don't need to use our loved ones as guinea pigs anymore. We do have alternative means to train, and uh, we're seeing a bit big trend towards that. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to Manu. Thank you, Jeff. As pre-stated, the current industry's focus is majorly channelized on development of technologies integrating AI and development of web-based simulation platforms. However, BIS research anticipates that the development of technologies enabling patient data integration with simulator would be the next emerging frontier in the era of healthcare robotics. The growing prominence for personalized care over a one-size-fits-all approach would be a pivotal factor in promoting the incorporation of case-specific simulation training. Technologies enabling the integration of patient data Acquired through diagnosis with the simulator through a cl cloud platform would open new avenues for precision healthcare. The integration of patient specific anatomies in simulation training would be a case with the highest similarity 
with realistic scenario and would enable surgeons to develop case specific surgical procedures the technology would give rise to next generation robotic simulators the advent of next generation robotic simulators would enhance procedural spontaneity and promote patient specific surgical planning with the ongoing plans for global launch of 5g network by 2020 one of the primary hurdles for the incorporation of telesurgery would be addressed bist research strongly recommends the industry players to focus on development of next generation robotic simulators enabling the integration of patient data with the simulator the advent of proposed technology will play a pivotal role in making telesurgery a reality further bist research recommends that surgical robotic companies and robotic simulation technology providers should collaborate to speed up the development of next generation surgical robotic systems enabling telesurgery thank you thank you jeff and manu for discussing the potential of robotic simulators so interpretively after listening to you both speak i can surely say that the organizations in the healthcare industry will continue to tap more and more opportunities in the coming years that will help them streamline the management of information across the value chain with that thought let me conclude today's session and now i declare the forum open for any questions from the listeners i request the listeners to kindly type in the questions on the q and a box available on the bottom of your screen and i will be happy to pass the questions to the esteemed speakers today we have our first question for jeff you have explained about the immersive vr simulation platform in the speech are they similar to web based simulation platforms will they inform haptics uh, at the moment uh, these are not like the web based platforms uh, these are applications using things like the oculus uh, it's it's important in our minds if you're going to practice setting up a robot that you're able to move your hands around and walk around the robot and and get a quote unquote feel for how uh, working with the robot uh, takes place um it's it's going to be less effective with the mouse you're just not going to get the hand eye motor learning um that said uh, we do not have full room size haptic devices um but we do have tactile devices so uh, the controllers these days do have vibration so there's some things we can do with uh, haptics Thank you Jeff for providing such an amazing response. Our next question is for Manu. Can you enlighten us more on the disciplines of surgery with potential for lucrative investment opportunities? Sure just small. As prestator general surgery is the dominating discipline incorporating robotic simulation technologies on a wider scale. The growing uh, incidence of uh, several procedures such as hernia repair gall bladder removal and collateral surgeries would significantly promote the requirement of simulation technologies globally further novel robotic solutions uh, offered by companies such as transcentrix and intuitu would increase the adoption of surgical robotic systems hence these factors are anticipated uh, to result the impressive 33% growth for general surgery robotic simulation platforms similarly orthopedic and neurological surgery uh, simulation platforms are expected to witness around 31% and approximately 25% growth rate uh, in the near future thank you thank you manu that was a fabulous answer so we have our next question again for jeff would web based simulation will enhance complexities specific to training further Uh, without a doubt, there is a place for web-based simulation. I would say most of this is cognitive. Um, I think there's there's definitely a need for cognitive learning, and certainly a web-based interface is great for facilitating that. Um, there are even gaming applications that help you learn your way through a procedure uh, that are available on on mobile uh, mobile devices. Um, however, this said, there is a huge need for hand-eye motor coordination. 
Um, it, it's great to be able to watch videos, but if uh, watching a video made you really good, I'm pretty sure I'd be a really good quarterback because I watch a ton of football, uh, yet I don't get my hands on a football. I don't throw the ball. So um, as a result, I don't progress. So I think, think you need a little bit of both. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeff, for such an insightful answer. Unfortunately, we have now run out of time. In the end, I would really like to thank Jeff for joining us in this session. We have really learned a lot about the future of robotic simulators. Also, thank you Manu for sharing your insight about the market dynamics, opportunity landscape, and lots more. We have got an overwhelming response through registrations and questions. With the help of Jeff and analysts at BIS, we will try to answer these questions and send it across to email. Before we conclude, we would like to inform about our next upcoming webinar on Microbiome, Changing Contours of Beauty and Personal Care and on 27th August. The registration link is available in chat box at the bottom of the screen. With this, I conclude today's webinar. Thank you everyone and I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.